Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. You'll notice that we have this person incognito, both from an audio and visual standpoint, and there is a reason for that. This person is coming out bravely to risk their career and potentially their life to do this interview, so we want to honor that accordingly. Uh, So we'll be referring to this person as Mr. QC. Uh, This individual works at one of, if not the arguably the world's biggest airline manufacturer to date, certainly here in the U.S., and they're coming here today to be a whistleblower to share the information that the other individual whose unfortunate demise did not allow them to do so, this person is valiantly picking up where the other left off. So we're going to be talking about that today, and uh, very important in where we are in the world of, of travel and everything else that we know It affects the financial, the geopolitical, all the aspects are intertwined. So again, if you're new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow and others to gain the knowledge that you are being afforded to this point. With all that said, Mr. QC, thank you for coming out bravely and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. Honored to have you. All right. So as much as you can share, Mr. QC, can you tell us about your background, how long you've been in this industry? what you've noticed in the last, let's say, last couple of years since the pandemic and why you're choosing to come out today and, and share the information that you are. Yeah, John, so thank you. Um, due to security reasons, uh, all I can say is that I've been in the industry for over four decades with half of that in the quality world. I've been at Boeing for more than two decades now, and uh, I understand all the aspects of the, of the company, um, as well as the non-regulated and regulated environments that we operate in. Uh, as we get deeper in the conversation, I think it will become very apparent that uh, I'm well-versed with uh, the way Boeing and the industry operates. Okay. So with that in mind, you working at Boeing, um, let's talk about some of the elephants in the room that most people know by now. It's, it's interesting, uh, Mr. Kesey, because I was flying back from family back here to Los Angeles on January 7th, and the infamous door blowing out on Alaska Airlines was on a flight that was going out a day prior to my uh, departure. So that was a little close to home for me personally. So it's interesting that we're having this interview because there's just so many things that correlate, as you know. So in that instance, we had a door blow out. I think it was about 16,000 feet on Alaska Airlines Flight 1282. And now the National Transportation Safety Board, also known as the NTSB, has been stonewalled for the last two year, excuse me, last two plus months in this investigation. In, in your professional opinion, what happened here, and why would Boeing not cooperate with the NTSB? Well, uh, John, it's interesting. Um, when the story first broke, briefly, it was um, felt like there was going to be a slant or a spin towards uh, Spirit being responsible for that. Um, you know, it was there was something you know said about uh, that it happened at the factory prior to delivery, uh, the Spirit factory. Well, the very nature of that issue, uh, four bolts being omitted from the door uh, when it arrived at Boeing and it had got through all of its, um, you know, work that had been done internally, um, that would have been caught inevitably uh, before the panels would have went up um, around the door area there. So uh, it's more than likely that would have never happened if that was done properly pro- properly uh, you know prior to closing out areas in our business it's a requirement that quality quality be on the final buy-off when those types of things happen um, and depending on how critical um, it really is uh, will determine whether or not an inspector will actually hang around and you know watch the areas be closed out uh, you know thankfully a uh, whistleblower came out and before the story could take off, um, you know, they confirmed that it indeed was Boeing that was responsible for that. Uh, personally, I want to thank whoever did that. Um, if you hadn't done that, uh, it's a very good possibility that this uh, would not have been brought to light. And, you know, this story could have taken a spin 
in another direction and um you know the uh the ultimate responsibility you know cloaked um never would i have thought you know um in all my years we would ever you know be at a point where we are inflection point in the industry where you know we're talking about things like this and uh to think that you know Boeing has no paperwork to cover that um, is just an amazing uh, thing to uh, to think about. You need to you need to wrap your head around that. Um, in this industry, you don't do anything without something driving you to do something, and that's that's just the way it is. Hmm. Um, you know the, the reason they wouldn't cooperate. I think it's painfully obvious. Um, they they can't back up the work with paperwork. And after somebody came forward and said that uh, we had done something in the factory, um, not having that paperwork on hand uh, to validate, verify, corroborate that we had done what we should have done um, is not a good thing. Um, it's, uh, it's probably criminal. Right. It's yeah, it is. It is really almost inconceivable that we're even talking about this, quite frankly. But you know, we can't sweep these issues on, anymore under the rug. And and you know, our channel is certainly dedicated to you know bringing the elephant in the room as it relates to financial and geopolitical. And, and this is equally important because we're talking about the lives of so many people potentially at risk each and every single day, as you well know. So, with that in mind, Mr. QC, we've been hearing uh, these stories sort of. <clears throat> reciprocating and repeating over and over and over again. In fact, I remember, I think it was about three plus weeks ago, we reported on our channel. I'm sure you're well aware there was a, I think it was a 777 flying out of San Francisco on United. The wheel just came off in, 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 in the takeoff process, which was, I've certainly never seen, or <laughs> I'm, you know, there may have been stories about it, but I've never seen or heard experience in my lifetime. And, you know, just over the weekend, you heard about a 737 uh, on Southwest where the wing, the right wing, I believe, was coming off. We also posted that on our Telegram as well. So you're just hearing one story, more, one incredulous story after the other coming out with major airline incidents since the Alaska issue in January. Um, what's going on with that and, and where do you see the line being drawn? We say that, you know, although we keep hearing Boeing, 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 um, some of the issues that we're seeing can be attributed to or, or could be attributed to other things like our airline customers, um, their own internal issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion, training, uh, experience, um, a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, our suppliers and theirs. Uh, so, for example, the, the 777 wheel that fell off um, and landed in a parking lot, um, you know, immediately it was uh, Boeing, you know, was, was the culprit or to blame. But uh, unless that aircraft was delivered, you know, out of the factory uh, recently and hadn't had any, you know, any type of maintenance performed on it, such as a tire change, wheel and tire change, um, you know, you really can't say that it's Boeing's fault. So... Um, you know, it's, uh, it's either, you know, just depends on the, the, the actual, uh, where it came from, where the, where the paperwork, you know, you got to go back, review the paperwork and look at where, um, you know, everything leads back to who did what they did. And that's the, the importance of the paperwork and, uh, transparency. It proves right. ownership and culpability. Well, well, that brings up another good sort of additional point, right? Mr. QC is this is symptomatic of the industry as a whole, correct? So um, what is in fact, in your estimation, going on with the aerospace industry as, an, as a general overview? Well, first, let me preface this, uh, that I'm including, you know, kind of like all companies, right? In, mm -hmm. including space uh with the exception of of spacex um boeing did a little study uh, internally for internal use only and uh what i can say is that 
um, and identified SpaceX as just a clear leader of being able to get things done. Um, if you notice, they're launching rockets sometimes two, three times uh, a day. And, uh, you know, they're just able to get things done. Uh, I know people that work there, and they have corroborated this. Um, you know, Boeing and United, uh, or I'm sorry, they, they just don't embrace DEI, okay? Uh, Elon, Elon Musk has been very um, open about that, uh, very critical of, of Boeing. Uh, but you've got United and other uh, companies out there that are, you know, waving the flags and doing all that stuff. So, but, uh, you know, basically, if anybody wants to know what a company really um, is about, go to their website, go to social media sites, um, mainstream media, um, most of the major companies within the, uh, the industry um, are owned by BlackRock and Vanguard. And uh, they all kind of stand for the same thing. They, they do what they're told to do. Remember, uh, Larry Fink said, you know, uh, if you want our money, you're going to do what we tell you to do. So when it comes to, you know, the, the, the organizations they support, uh, the grooming of our children, uh, the, the different things within our society that are just uh, seem to be um, really hitting right now, uh, it has a lot to do with, you know, what um, corporate America is really driving out. Um, you know, secondly, about 10 years ago, there was a big announcement um, within Boeing uh, that we needed to di uh, diversify. Uh, shortly after that, uh, many senior white uh, managers uh, moved on to lesser positions or they, you know, retired. Um, it was very fast, very quick, um, and a uh, definite shift uh, was felt. Um, those people were replaced by white women. Uh, you know, many of their portfolios bragged about their educations and what they'd done, but really what they lacked was um, experience, um, technical aptitude, um, you know, things that you just can't get from going to school and, you know, we're talking about in a meeting. You just, you, there's certain things you can't do. Um, you know, immediately things started to break. Um, joint meetings, communications between our, our two companies at the time, BCA and BDS, uh, were severed. And the only uh, saving grace was that the middle and the lower management um, as well as the people doing the jobs, really, I mean, they understood what they were doing. They've been doing it for a long time. And this is after we've had a previous go, you know, anything happens, it seems like, where, you know, we lose all of our institutional memory due to some retirement or some, you know, industry changing thing, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we, we just went through a major, um, you know, plan scamdemic. Uh, we lost probably 50% of our workforce to VLOs. And, um, you know, without that institutional memory or knowledge, uh, we um, have not been, you know, faring too well at this point in time. Um, you know, as far as the, the rest of the story um, now with, you know, we have a very young workforce, um, two to three years in some roles. Uh, those are, uh, depending on the position, um, sometimes it takes three to five years to really take and get somebody up to speed on what they're doing um, due to the, the technical nature and you know, diversity of some of the roles that some of our people play or, or, or work in. Um, my advice is that every, you know, everyone needs to listen to the Buck Sexton video uh, with Porter Stansberry. Um, he go he go into some detail about the company, where we're at. Um, it's, you know, super important um, because it really um, appears that you know, they're, they're, some of us inside just feel like they're trying to implode the company. And, you know, we can't figure out why. 
um, you know what, the chickens have come home to roost. And, um, you know, now we have an accountant running our company. Um, I don't think, you know, as Porter says, I don't, I'm not sure she can change the owner car, but, um, you know, I'm just, the, most of our leadership high up is questionable. They're administrative and, you know, they just, um, they don't know how to build airplanes. Okay. So a lot that we need to kind of break down in this, Mr. QC, let's go back a second. Those who are not familiar with some of the anagrams, what is a VLO? Can you define that a little bit? Yeah. A VLO is a voluntary layoff. So when they, you know, when, when they plan, you know, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. And then uh, all of a sudden it was pretty apparent that, you know, lockdowns were going to be going on for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, people working from home, travel. Um, it was very obvious that this was going to be a long time. And then they started talking about, you know, with, with people just sitting around with nothing to do, that uh, they were going to offer, you know, these voluntary layoffs for people who were close to retirement and, and wanted to go. Or ready at that time. So would it be fair to characterize that as sort of a a polite exodus for the more seasoned crowd? Well, it's a it's a way to decrease your operating costs um, tremendously, and you know, uh, bring in young people who are much more affordable because they don't have the experience or the knowledge that. Um, you know, the people that left had, you know, 20, 30 years. Hmm. I see. Can't replace that overnight. Right, right, of course. So, you know, we had also covered this on our, our telegram a few weeks ago that you had a, your CEO, long time CEO had stepped down and there was new leadership. Can you talk about that a little bit? What you're aware of the, the new CEO, what their mentality is, and if in any way it's divergent from the uh, beliefs and business practices of your previous CEO? Well, I think, you know, Porter Stansberry goes into the, you know, the people that are currently running the company. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, who David Calhoun is, where he came from, um, Steffi Pope, who she is, where she's come from. Um, but again, you know, these people are just, um, I think, you know, ex-GE folks, and there's been a lot of talk about GE and how, you know, Jack Welch was revered as a heck of a businessman, but now they're coming out and saying that, you know, hey, he, he raped and pillaged the company, um, his administrator, you know, his, uh, his folks. So um, I think it's just the bottom line is all we hear is money, money, money. Uh, we don't have any money to do this or that. Um, training has taken a back seat. Um, you know, they've tried to pare down processes and procedures. Um, but, you know, between the environments, uh, the commercial and the military side of things, uh, the commercials may be a little more easy to deal with, whereas the military uh, or the BDS side, uh, you have a whole lot of different customers who have a whole lot of needs and demands. And so there's a lot of variation when it comes to working in that environment. Sorry about that. Um, I did have an opportunity, Mr. QC, you mentioned Buck Sexton, uh, to go back and, and kind of listen to that podcast a couple of times. And the question I kept finding myself asking among other things is why would Boeing intentionally try to sabotage itself? What would be the benefit of that? Well, you know, speculation, but Hey, think of agenda 2030. Um, and, uh, when 90% of the population has been wiped out by mandatory MRNA gene therapy, biological weapon disguised as a vaccine, you don't need multiple large aircraft companies in existence. Um, if you bankrupt and dissolve Boeing, um, you can control the industry with one company such as um, 
Airbus, a socialist Marxist company who was funded and run by the EU government. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, where where's the FAA in all this? I mean, aren't they supposed to do? I mean, we know there's corruption there, but isn't their main job to run oversight and quality control and protect the interests of the people, or is that also just gone out the window in your estimation as well? Well, you know what the NTSB uh, recently said that uh, Boeing is being very helpful, but I think that's horseshit. Um, the FAA has right of entry into any and all Boeing facilities, um, as well as our supply base. Um, rights. They normally have a designated parking spot above the CEO and senior leadership in these companies. Um, the FAA, um, you know, is a is a, is at the moment feels impotent and complicit. Uh, the only thing the FAA is good for at the moment, in my opinion, is pointing fingers and deflecting their um, incompetence on others. Um, these people are no different than the CIA, FBI, or CDC, to be quite honest. Um, they're all uh, do-overs. Mm. And you know what? I'm, let me just also yeah. say that, you know, I don't want uh, the... the Generally, the good people on the floor are working hard to do the best they can with what they have. Um, of the agencies that I just mentioned, um, you know what? It's the leadership that needs to go. Um, that's where they need to, you know, go in and completely overhaul these places. Uh, there are good people out there that know what they're doing, but um, they've just been regulated and mandated and, you know, demanded to do certain things and, you know, they, they don't have a choice sometimes. I draw the line at loss of life and, you know, safety and quality. Personally, I don't compromise. Of course. So with that said, Mr. QC, is there a way to fix Boeing? And, and if there is, what would it take to do that at this point? You know, this is a big, long answer here, John, so you may have to stop me, but um, if the desire is to make Boeing great again, uh, Boeing needs to be withdrawn as a public company, and uh, myself and others uh, believe the term uh, is that they need to be nationalized. Um, I think Trump was accused of being a nationalist at one point, right, through his uh, presidency. No more board of criminal directors. Um, they don't do anything. They don't contribute anything to our company. Uh, we, the people, are now the owners and the shareholders. Uh, you know, this is a critical, uh, vital company to our country and the world. Um, and it really needs to answer to us, the people. Um, every living, uh, breathing, sovereign man and woman of the United States Republic should be the shareholders. Um, you know, and this is difficult, but I think all operations, they need to be halted until the military can come in and do a tip to tail evaluation and remove all incompetent, compromised leadership at all levels. If someone isn't an engineer person that is trained, certified and battle tested, or the work that they manage or oversee, then they need to look for another job that better suits their skill sets. No more DEI approved individuals uh, with indoctrination degrees, such as, you know, like accounting or liberal arts. <laughs> uh, who doesn't, uh, whoever doesn't possess a technical uh, education, certification, training, or experience to manage the statements of work that they are managing. Um, they need to they need to go away or again find another place where they're better suited uh once we've established a solid leadership team um you know whose intent is to to build and maintain safe uh and quality products and services i would say operations at that point um could resume 
um, next. Um, they need to go to uh, human resources. You know, just more indoctrinated, racist, criminal people. We're carrying the water of and for the aforementioned unqualified leadership. Um, and review every internal decision that was made to terminate any employee for the last 10 years. You know, wouldn't that be something if people were reporting discrimination years ago and it all got swept underneath the rug? I'm certain people were raising the flag as far back as 10 years ago. Uh, then they need to roll into um, ethics. Um, they have what would they call a little link now, speak up now. Um, and, uh, you know, who are nothing but lawyers. And they're only looking out for Boeing's best interest, to be quite honest. Um, and review every case that has been filed for validity and relevance. This is super important. Um, if need be, they need to go back and charge and prosecute any and all individuals that did, didn't do the right thing. Just like the doctors and nurses were killing people and lawyers um, who have been practicing administrative admiralty law and violating the original constitution. Um, now, go to OSHA, review every claim that has been filed in the last 10 years and determine actual relevance and validity. Um, then and if necessary, um, those cases need to be re reopened and investigated um, if necessary. You know, Mr. Barnett's case, um, the Boeing whistleblower who mysteriously uh, killed himself after being dispo uh, deposed, <laughs> disposed, sorry, um, no pun intended, uh, deposed by Boeing lawyers, um, you know, that took like four to five years to get to dip depositions. Um, that's horrific when you think about it. You know, that man had, a, you know, evidence, um, objective evidence to back up his claims and, you know, unairworthy parts being installed on aircraft amongst just a few things. Uh, to think that that took four to five years to get to where it is now is ridiculous. It's, um, it's a crime in itself. Um, the whistleblower laws, they're broken, so they need to fix that. Uh, our Congress, our lawmakers, our uh, legislative branch, judicial branch, need to go in there and fix this. Um, <clears throat> you know, this, this would also include um, in, in the aircraft industry, if you file a claim, um, if it's aircraft related, it goes through the FAA. So they get their chance to take a look and weigh in. Um, obviously, um, if you've read Mr. Barnett's case, I don't think it was a favorable ruling for him based on what they had. And, and again, that's a fallacy. Um, then, uh, they need to go to the EEOC and investigate allegations made through that agency as well. Uh, again, investigate, prosecute any valid claims that should have been prosecuted, um, holding the criminal leadership. Uh, at, you know, these agencies and in our company um, is the only way that culture is going to change. It's the only way. Uh, finally, allow any whistleblower to come forward, regardless of how long it is, with complete anonymity for obvious reasons. Um, investigate and validate any claims um, you know, not everything will be a claim, I'm sure, but they should all be looked at. Um, <clears throat> it should include a deep dive into non-conformant systems within Boeing um, that they use uh, for both commercial and government programs. Um, we need to understand and make sure that any issues that were raised in the past have been properly dealt with and not just signed off. Uh, you know, just, um, sorry, I lost my no, train okay. of thought. That's okay. Um, 
But just, you know, one more follow up here. And, and the most important reason of all, uh, we give billions of dollars of our tax dollars uh, to Boeing and neocon politicians, which makes us the people, the majority shareholders, and we need to demand that every quality and safety issue be identified and addressed and every penny be accounted for. Um, these things don't happen and soon Boeing will continue to spiral out of control and get worse, um, in my opinion. And uh, that's hard to believe as our company is in the crapper right now. Uh, make no mistake about that. Uh, until we get back to focusing on hiring and promoting the smartest, well-trained, technically sound, credentialed, qualified people for the jobs they perform, quality and safety won't improve. Okay. Well, thank you for the uh, thank you for the information on that, Mr. QC. Uh, I have a few more key questions to ask you in regards to all this. So you mentioned President Trump, which was kind of going to be on one of my touch points for you. He had said, if you remember a while back, he was talking about with Boeing, many uh, rallies, even, you know, White House discussions, he would talk about at the podium about in regards to Space Force and aerospace related items. He talked about he would make a deal with Boeing if there was a deal to be made. Do you think there was some implication in what he was saying? Do you think maybe he sort of suspected or knew all along that uh, Boeing was going to have to um, disseminate or, or come apart the seams or just be uh, taken down, I guess, summarily? Uh, and if you do think that, uh, what type of lifespan do you think Boeing might have at this point? Yeah, um, you know, interesting. I kind of believe, I have to believe myself that, you know, um, the good guys, which I do believe good guys are in control of our country right now and doing everything they have to do to ensure our sovereignty and our safety, um, as well as God, being led by God, actually. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, that he and, and these people... Um, obviously know what uh, what Boeing's all about, especially on the defense side. Um, that's a huge bucket of money, right, that gets uh, dispersed to Boeing. So um, definitely, uh, I think they knew, um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know, we, we should... <laughs> look at the VC 25 B program and see how that's doing right now, because that was a deal made by Trump, but um, I don't think that's going too well right now. Cost overruns and a lot of things going on. But um, uh, as far as the, the lifespan of Boeing, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's interesting. I, I really feel like, you know, the, the mantra has always been that Boeing is too big to fail. But uh, when you get to that point, um, you know, there's trouble and to, you know, see what we're going through right now should be no surprise. Um, I hope we continue on. Um, I personally, um, love the commercial side of the business. Um, I'm not too fond of the military, but, uh, if we needed to build products that supported our, uh, ability to protect ourselves and our sovereignty, then, you know, I would participate in back that, um, I do every day but um you know it'll be interesting to see where this shakes out because i, I just don't think things are going to go very well until there's a major turnaround in you know policies procedures um how we operate um, who we hire um, who's responsible for operations things like that okay fair enough so this is just me kind of putting on my, my devil's advocate hat for the people who might be watching this and digesting the information you're saying. And you talked about a lot of the layoffs of, you know, certain leadership. And, and now it's in a, from what you're saying, a, a compromised position with the people who don't have the experience that the previous uh, employees and leadership had. Uh, there might be some who are saying, well, this guy's just got sour grapes about what's going on and maybe they're, you know, he's bitter that they're trying to phase him out. Um, you have been, you've told me off camera that, uh, that several times Boeing has tried to 
get rid of you and legally has been unable to do so. Can you just kind of address that point to those listening who might uh, be concerned that, you know, you're letting your being wondering if your personal interests are getting in the way of your overall view of Boeing or, you know, if there's just a, a different angle that they can't see because they're not on the front lines, can you just maybe speak to that briefly? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think for the people that are, you know, the legal beagles and the senior managers maybe listening in on this at some point, um, you know, they're not going to have anything but one perception. Um, honestly, you, you've hired some or promoted some very um, sharp people. Um, there have been people that have been hired and promoted that um, may not even possess um you know, say experience in inspection. So, uh, but, you know, there are good people that we've, we've hired. The, the problem is, is that you, you know, have to let, um, especially going into, you know, quality is a very difficult role. Um, if, you know, you're not on the top of your game and, and you're, you know, not, providing adequate information to back up, you know, the issues that you're bringing forward, then, you know, you'll be discounted and uh, discredited very quickly. Uh, so you're always walking a tightrope, but you know, the people that are to the industry or, you know, coming up through the ranks, um, I've seen, and I, and I work with some dynamite young people. And, uh, and again, it's not about uh, race or religion or anything like that. It's just about experience. And, uh, you know, when, when people have the right experience, uh, schooling, um, education, um, on-the-job training, um, it doesn't matter. The, some of them are just amazing. But, you know, not everybody is uh, built the same or equal. And we have to consider that. Okay. Hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, I just, you know, wanted people to kind of, those who might be concerned where your interests are for your personal situation, uh, just for you to address that, just to counterbalance the argument so that both sides are kind of, you know, equally represented as much as possible to give it the most, you know, fair and objective um, position, I guess, for lack of a better term. So, well, you know, Don, let me say this. The please. thing that keeps me going right now is that I work with some, some great people and it's very difficult, um, sometimes to, you know, keep your chin up and keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. But, um, I really to, to think about, um, not being, um, in the game right now and not giving those people a chance based on not having anybody to lean on or talk to when they're in a tight spot because there are times when people, you know, can't go to management because they, you know, they know that they're going to have a tough conversation. And, you know, when you start to get the old lazed look, um, you know, you're in trouble, right? And you know that you don't have the backing or the support you need to go do your job. And that, is in this business in the quality world is uh, very scary. Hmm. So when you've talked to some of the people, I mean, obviously you can't speak for everyone, but the people you're talking about that are in sort of a compromised position, are they sort of reporting to you that they, they feel the same way? They have the same kind of concerns and, um, if they do, what do you, what do you typically say to them? Oh, uh, you know, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of demand for training. Um, people really want to learn, you know, uh, the job that they're doing, um, you know, training, um, OJB, um, getting the perspective of someone, someone has been doing things for 20 or 30 or even more years. I mean, we have people working for 40 some years, 50 years at Boeing, but you know, it's, it's those kinds of people that 
when the younger people are able to hang out with them and just, you know, talk, ask questions, observe uh, their ability to absorb and learn um, is really what they're looking for, right? That's what they want. So um, there's just a lot of talk right now about a lot of things, but uh, management support, you know, good, strong leadership that's technically adept. Um, and then, you know, training um, different things about the different departments that people work in, environments. Uh, there is just a whole lot of lack of training. And then there's a lot of stuff that's broken. It's never for years hasn't been, a, you know, systems, processes, procedures that have not been tended to. Uh, we're supposed to review those things every so often. And, you know, that isn't happening on schedule. So you have outdated processes and procedures that just don't work anymore. Hmm. Okay. Uh, last question for today, Mr. QC, because I know that your time is precious as well. Uh, so with everything that we've talked about with respect to Boeing, you had told me offline that you didn't even feel safe flying on Boeing airplanes and you work for them, which is a very kind of a frightening and telling statement, right? And doesn't send a lot of confidence for people to, uh, you know, book with Boeing. Unfortunately, for most people who can't fly privately at the moment, they're at the mercy of the particular airline that they either have, you know, an allegiance with or can get the best price. And it's kind of a, you know, you know, Russian roulette of what plane they're going to get in regards to this subject. Uh, what planes or what, what air, well, not even so much airlines, what planes would you say you feel good about going forward into the future that you have confidence in if it's not in fact Boeing? Well, let me just say that, you know, right now, no, I'm not comfortable flying, but it's not just due to issues at Boeing. Um, you know, Boeing's having issues, United's having issues. Um, you know, they're employing some of the same practices when it comes to recruitment and promotion and things like that. Um, the FAA has uh, come out and said they're going to lower standards for air traffic controllers. Um, and, you know, with regards to mental, um, you know, issues or whatever they're, they're calling that. But, you know, it's, a, it's really all of it. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the 37 and how they need to, you know, get rid of it and go to another airplane because, you know, they've taken and stretched it out and done a lot of things with it. I personally am not an engineer, but I know that the, the latest, um, when you, you know, with what happened with the previous crashes with, um, was it Air Lion and, you know, a couple years ago, um, it, it really begs the question, right? I mean, who we leave at this point? Um, do they need to scrap it or ditch it or, or you know, build another airplane or, or, you know, things good to go? So um, I know that our, our 777 has a, a really good uh, safety record. Um, I think uh, for the most part, I think there was one that went down in San Francisco. Um, that was, I believe, pilot error. Um, you know, the five, seven good airplane, they were talking about bringing that back at one point, but I think one of our, one of our higher ups lost their job over that comment, but, uh, you know, Trump has a seven, five, seven, um, they love that good airplanes. So it really, it has to do with just at this point in time, um, in the industry, um, there's a whole lot of factors that make me, um, not want to fly right now. And, and it's a lot of things. It's not just Boeing itself. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I just want to try to give a comprehensive view for the audience to kind of, you know, talk about what are good alternatives, you know, is, is, is in other words, would, would an Airbus be a better alternative to the Boeing, you know, airlines that favor those or, uh, you know, just different airplanes or airlines, not even airlines, air, airplanes specifically altogether that you felt had a really good uh, track record in spite of what's going on outside of Boeing? Well, you know, I realistically, 
um, you know, maybe Airbus has, you know, some, though it doesn't have some of the problems that we do right now, I, I don't know. Um, they're making a lot of new products. Um, they, you know, right now, I guess, you know, the biggest question is the 737, you know, max and whether or not that thing is really safe. So if you have any questions, I would definitely try to do your research. Um, if you're not comfortable, then maybe you avoid that and look for, you know, other planes, other routes, things like that. But, uh, you know, Airbus has some of the same suppliers that we do. Uh, so, you know, if those people are having trouble, then, you know, Airbus is also having trouble uh, with those parts. So, but, uh, you know, I say that it, it's a, that's a general kind of statement. Um, I don't have objective evidence or proof. I'm just saying, you know, um, they're subject to the same um, environment um, that, that, you know, we're operating in as far as, you know, using the same suppliers in some cases for some of their products. Understood. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, um, since obviously in your case, we're not going to have people find out where they can find out about you to protect your anonymity. Uh, what are any final thoughts or suggestions or anything that you want to say to the audience from a heart level that you'd like to share with them as a parting thought for today? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the justice department has opened up a criminal investigation, uh, subpoenas that you, um, you know what, I don't, many people probably think Boeing is going to stand behind them, um, and protect them. But uh, I think that's going to, that they're going to find out that, uh, they're going to be on their own when that happens, if it happens. So, um, my advice to them is, you know, seek legal counsel if anybody has any uh, feelings like they're they're into something that they need help with. Um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're union or non-union. Um, you know, ethics, legal, you know, those people aren't your friends. Um, they stand with them for the company, period. Uh, my advice would be lawyer up, um, get help, get advice, and don't say anything uh, to Boeing at all because they're not gonna they're not gonna be there for you. Uh, protect yourselves. Um, also, you know, uh, John, I think I've given you a link for the Barnett case. Um, there was a article written by I think a Seattle. Uh, agency, whoever that was, um, you know, inside of it, there is the actual filing. Um, I, I hope people will go and read that and understand what a man who was trying to make sure that people were safe, what he went through for years. Mm -hmm. He showed up for years um, just trying to do the right thing. And he was harassed. He was mocked. Um, and, you know, it's sad, John, because there are people, even in quality, that um, don't have the confidence, uh, don't have the knowledge base. Um, they let fear control them. And rather than stand up and do the right thing, they won't do it. Right. And that's the human nature, right, is, is look at what we've gone through for the last, what, six, seven years, um, or, or, you know, the last three or four years, um, and following some dude wearing a mask. Um, it's sad, but that's human nature, right? That's people and how they operate sometimes. So um, anyway, Mr. Barnett was, uh, was a hero, um, and I hope that things will turn around here and that there'll be some justice for him, um, his family and, you know, other people too. Um, you know, being on an airplane at 16,000 feet and having uh, that door plug blow out at, I don't know, maybe two or two PSI or something, um, rather than 35,000 feet at six or seven PSI or whatever they pressurize that, tube two, um, if that would have happened at that altitude, 
other half of that airplane would have nightmares for the rest of their life if they survived that. Okay. So that's the thing. The people that, you know, these planes that crash and people die, they're gone. But these people that went through what they did, they have to live with that every day for the rest of their lives. So um, I hope that they get what they deserve when it comes to the lawsuit that's been filed. And uh, um, I hope their lawyer, instead of just looking at Alaska and Boeing, will consider, um, you know, indicting the FAA or, or you know, uh, filing a claim against them as well, because they're all, you know, they all had a part to play in that. Um, if, if everything, if the system would have been working the way it should have, that door plug would have never blown out of that airplane. It would have never happened. There's too many checks and balances in place within Boeing doing their job, but the FAA who should be walking the factory floor and have many people all over Alaska and or Southwest or anybody who's taking an airplane from Boeing should be a part of that process from the minute it's inducted into the factory until it goes out and the ribbons cut and, and the airplane flies off with its new owners. Uh, they all pay, play a part in that, and they should be, uh, they're all responsible. Agreed. Well, thank you again, uh, Mr. Cusi. We, we sincerely appreciate your time and, and making the sacrifice that you did to come on and, and share this information. And uh, we'd like to have you up again for a follow-up maybe next month and see what you're noticing uh, going on within the industry, respectively, and, uh, and we pray that this uh, continues to, to uh, shed a little bit more light on the subject uh, for the public. And we will leave that link of that uh, article that you were talking about. We will we will leave that in the description for people to see. Thank you for your time today, and we look forward to talking with you again in the future. Thanks, John. Thanks.